Hello, everyone. Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is Trading Simplified. So what are we talk about? Well, we have a lot to talk about as far as a methodology. Once again, I want to follow up from a few weeks ago where I talked about seeing each position to its fruition. And that's going to make a lot of sense in just one second. So this week we have a dead money report or possibly two of those. I'm going to continue my series on Jesse Livermore. And then, by the way, housekeeping, I do take requests that there's something you want me to cover. I could certainly take a break from Livermore and talk about whatever you guys want to talk about. You could also join me each week in a live webinar at DaveLearner.com slash webinar. And eventually, I'll probably go live on YouTube. And this webinar might go live on YouTube, too, uh, if, depending on whether or not the simulcast works. But if you want to attend live and ask questions, go to DaveLearner.com slash webinar. Register for one and you're registered for all as I add more and more shows. If you need to reach me, dailyline.com slash contact. If you need slides from this presentation and all the other presentations combined, and the file's getting actually pretty big, but just let me know if you want that. There's a lot of other stuff in there, including some members resources or some resources from my members area, such as a tracking sheet and all my books in PDF format and a bunch of other stuff. Twitter, at T. Folly Moron, or X, as you now call it. YouTube is at Dave Landry. All right, let's talk about the mystery charts and the methodology in action. So here's the portfolio and with the recommendations down below in the service for two of the stocks we're going to talk about today. The one we're going to focus on first is LFMD. It was a buy, 1,600 shares, 425 was the entry, three was a protective stop, and the initial profit target was 550 IPT, initial profit target, for a risk of one. 25. So just real quick, because this is probably a lesson in and of itself. The entry is above the recent highs. You give it a little wiggle room just in case it rallies up and comes back in. As I've said a thousand times, a lot of times I recommend the stock. People complain about it six months later, and I have no idea why they're complaining. And when I go back and look, I see that it never did trigger. But a lot of people will front run those setups and get in early. You can front run if you're in a rip roaring bull market, but we're not in that right now. Anyway, entry was 425, and stop was three points, which is, I'm sorry, yeah, three points for a risk of 125, entry minus the stop. So what happens in a case like this, this seems pretty wide on a percentage basis, but based on the volatility of the stock, as you'll see in one second, it really wasn't that far away. And then the IPT, you simply add the risk to the entry, and it gives you the IPT. I'll give you a blank tracking sheet if you go to the aforementioned stock charts link. So you can track your own trades, especially if you're with my methodology. By the way, the number of shares is based on, you can't see it, it's up here, but I have the account size at 100K, and I just keep it at 100K to make it easy. Even if there's gains or losses, I just keep it at 100K. In other words, I don't do any compounding as far as the hypothetical results. But obviously, my own accounts, I will compound by taking more risk on as the account grows. So here's the LFMD. You can see it was in a pretty serious uptrend. You could just draw your big blue arrow. It then pulls back to its 30 EMA, creating a lanyard light pullback. If you look at the illustrator down below, we had nearly 50 days of upside lanyard light, meaning that the lows have been greater than the moving average for a long, long, long time, making it a, almost a making it almost a textbook type of setup. So this is a lanyard light pullback. I often say, stealing a line from Linda Rasky, that all you need is one pattern to be successful. Of course, the next question is, what's the one pattern? And I would say Landry Light pullbacks, especially when the overall market itself is trending nicely and not chopping sideways or headed lower. Big caveat right there, I kind of slipped in, so you might want to write that down. Entry was here, the stop was down there, and the initial profit target up here. You can rewind this and look at the spreadsheets or take a look at the slides to see those calculations once again but that's what they look like on the chart so let's take a look at what happened it triggered and then starts meandering back and forth and back and forth and we were profitable then unprofitable then profitable then unprofitable a bit of a jackie mason mason position up and down it's up it's down you can see kind of all over the place at this juncture after about six weeks you're probably fed up with the position and looking to bail. I know I would be, and if I didn't put out a trading service every day with a game plan, then I probably would have given up a long time ago. But I'm like, no, 
dang it, I've got to keep this losing position. And I had some foul words I almost just said <laughs> in my portfolio because that's what I said to do. So at this point, again, you're probably wondering, is it dead money? Dead money is money that has little or no chance of ever appreciating. But you don't know if it's going to be dead money or not. The market might just be consolidating a little bit before it takes off. In this case, fortunately, it did eventually take off, but not without coming back in and us going underwater for a little while. So we did take partial profits on this one earlier today. Knock on wood, in spite of a market getting I wouldn't say annihilated, but getting hit really hard. Today is September 26, 2023, FYI. It's nice to have a position headed in your favor. Believe me, this doesn't always happen on bad days, but it sure is nice when one of these guys can defy gravity like this. Now, one thing that I wanted to point out is following your plan is the way to go. Shorter term, you'll probably find that you can make more money or save more money or avoid losing more money by bailing on your plan. But longer term, if you quit when things turn sour and you haven't gotten stopped out, in other words, you're busting your plan and you quit here, you're never going to get here. And I hate to use the word hopefully and hopefully beyond. Now, it doesn't happen that often. I don't want to make it sound like it does. But every now and then we get in one and we're in it for weeks, months, and sometimes even years. And we get the occasional 500% gain. And that's where the real money is but if you constantly quit you'll never get there so here's an update on k and f you can see once we hit the initial profit target half of the profits were taken and our stop was moved up to break even and then for the last couple of months it really hasn't done a whole lot we're still above water but it hasn't done a tremendous amount if it stops out so be it i probably will drop an f-bomb but i'll look back and say well at least i was able to squeeze out 1% on the entire portfolio on the position. And maybe, maybe just maybe after lots of consolidation here, this will be my dead money report part two. Let's take a look at the only other remaining stock in the portfolio. You can see down below, this is Bowtie Proper Order. And you can see the parameters up here, 10 simple, 20 exponential, 30 exponential. And green means that they're an uptrend proper order. The 10 is greater than 20, 20 is greater than 30. And yellow means they're beginning to cross over a little bit. So yellow is kind of a caution. It's kind of cool. I know you want to party with me, but it's kind of cool the way it's set up in here with the, the way the programmer programmed it to where it's green lights, like a traffic light, good, right? Yellow light caution and red light is no bueno. But you can see we did roll over from this bow tie formation right here. It looks like a bow tie when they come together and spread out. So there's your bow tie. And then you look for a minor pullback at least. A, a deeper pullback would be great. But a lot of times with these transitional patterns, early trend patterns, you don't get the nice deep pullback you're waiting on. And that's a little bit more uh, involved lesson there. But essentially, we're playing on the psychology of the market. A lot of other players are probably waiting for that deeper pullback. And then sometimes you get a trigger and it just keeps imploding and people keep waiting it off the hook and then they end up throwing in the towel. Now, in this particular case, obviously, we immediately, after feeling pretty good for half a day, went into water with this position and then finally we're back in black on it. So here was a recommendation on 8, it was for 824, so this was probably published the night of 823. And if you go in to davelander.com slash archives. You can see those older services. Also, if you're subscribed to my YouTube channel over the last several weeks, and then from now on, I'm going to start uploading those services or I'm going to continue uploading the services there. They'll be on a little bit of a delayed basis, but you'll be able to get them fairly quickly and see what was going on and how we're doing warts and all. So the entry was here. The stop was up here. Initial profit target was down here. Remember, this is a short, so obviously we want it to go down. And so far, we haven't hit that IPT on that one. Now, the bottom line is plan your trade and trade your plan. And as we talked about a few weeks ago, see each position to its fruition. Okay, let's shift gears and get into mind the trade. If you have any questions, you could also leave them down below. I don't get an alert on YouTube, though, just an FYI, when they're not on my channel. This video will be posted on the stock charts channel. I do try to check them fairly often, but if, if you need to reach me with something specific, 
DaveLeonard.com slash contact once again. So lately, we've been talking about the wisdom of Jesse Livermore. 90% of everything so far, 95% of everything so far has come from reminiscence of a stock operator. I think I'm up to about chapter 16 or 17 on that. And then, as I've been saying, I've been pulling a little color commentary and trying to get a little background information from the biography, which is excellent by Smitten. And then How to Trade Stocks is not quite as exciting as the other books, but it's worth reading nonetheless. And I'll give it one extra read to see if there's anything in there that I might be missing. Or we might be missing. So when we last left off, he couldn't attempt to rise from the ashes until he freed himself of his encumbrances. So he owed a million and a half dollars and was having a hard time operating knowing that he owed people. And that's one thing I often talk about is extraneous influences. When you need money, it's really hard to trade properly because you can do one or two things. You're going to trade in mediocre markets, trying to make something happen instead of letting the market come to you. And the second thing you're going to do is you possibly might not take a trade, even though it looks fantastic because you're worried about losing money. And as I'm saying this is a third thing that could possibly happen, which I've been guilty of here and there, especially if I'm doing unnecessary day trades, is trading not to lose. An S&G type of trade where you put in a super tight stop and you're more than likely to get stopped out on noise alone. You're thereby guaranteeing yourself a loss. Now, he made a whole bunch of money and he decides to just pile in the cotton and my guess is that he was likely free and easy from his $1.5 million that he made in stocks. And he ended up losing several hundred thousand dollars overnight. So he still had some money left over to trade, but he did have to pay his creditors. I believe it was $1 million. I might have said one point five earlier, but he owed his creditors just about a million. And then he blew, blew a, few thousand, a few hundred thousand overnight trading cotton. But he did take his lumps instead of holding on to cotton and losing all of his money, and he paid off his debts from the previous profits and stocks. Now, each week as I dig deeper and deeper into Livermore, I'm coming up with a lot of random thoughts. And one thing is he often violated his own rules. Like in one case, he said when he was making his comeback, he was going to wait and wait and wait and wait and wait until the steel stock got to 100, and then he was going to buy it. But he didn't. He ended up buying at 98. So he does violate his own rules quite a bit. And he's often guilty of not letting the market come to him. Now, he put on this huge coffee position, which we'll talk a little bit about. And he did it before the market began to move. So for one year, he lost a ton of money in, in coffee. All his options expired. And then coffee began to move. And then it began to pile on once again. So he got in early in that case, and in the aforementioned case where he got in at 98 instead of 100. He does seem to preach waiting for follow-through and triggers and the market to move in, in the intended direction. But he also tends to front-run a little bit or, or try to outsmart the market and get in early. Now, he seems to have to be forced into destitution over and over again before having renewed discipline. Now, remember, Livermore was a troubled man. He ended up putting a bullet in his head, so he did have his issues. And I forget how many men have killed themselves before, but he married some woman where the three prior husbands all killed themselves. So uh, very bad to be a trend follower with that trend, obviously. And he did have a lot of other bad behaviors, like when he would go in, he would try to corner a market and he would over leverage and he ended up losing for instance in the last example hundreds of thousands of dollars overnight in cotton because he went so crazy in it now again maybe he was feeling free and rich and free and loose or lottery rich i think is what i'm looking for and decided to think he could just parlay the money because he was feeling like god so one thing that i was thinking about before going live is it really helps to understand trading to recognize his bad behaviors. Now, what am I preaching today? Plan the trade and trade the plan. And he often didn't do that. I would encourage you to re 
read it yearly and I find that every time I reread it especially now because I'm reading it and at the same time I'm listening to it and then I'm putting together a presentation on it I'm discovering quite a bit and absorbing a lot of new things and again one thing I'm discovering is he did have a lot of faults so be careful in following him at least until you understand when he's doing the wrong thing now each reread should bring to light a reminder of what to do and after you've been trading for a while more importantly or as importantly a reminder of what not to do now his philosophies are amazing that's why we're knee deep into them do as he says not as he often does and again not to beat the dead horse but that that's what really helps me do what i should i'm certainly not a perfect individual well just ask my wife but when it comes to markets i'm certainly not a, a perfect individual i don't do the right thing all the time and I do succumb to these extraneous influences that I've been talking about so much however with the trading service I put the plan out there and I try to stick to it as closely as possible so I can show the actual trade win lose or draw and say look this is what I said I was gonna do and this is what I actually did so make sure you're of course planning that trade and trading that plan now Livermore ends up losing money to government intervention. There must be 50 ways to lose your money, right? And I almost didn't cover this because I felt like it wasn't that relevant. But every now and then, especially if you're short and the market's really imploding, and then the government steps in and bails out the market or bails out a company you're short. And then as I began thinking about it more and more, I thought it's important to cover this because, again, there must be 50 ways to lose your money. And I think about like the rug pull on GME where Robin Hood made it to where you could only sell your shares and not buy them. And then GME absolutely imploded. So that, uh, if memory serves, I may have had a few shares of GME at the time and it caused a few F-bombs. And I know throughout history, the government has bailed out markets and stocks and I've been heavily short during those times. So he did lose a lot of money due to government intervention. And as I said earlier, this, this actually happened after more bad behavior. So this is when he bought a whole bunch of coffee because he had a bunch of good reasons to buy it, but the tape wasn't there. And so he ended up losing money for a year. And then he really got screwed when the government intervened. What happened? The unexpectable. What had never happened in anybody's experience, what I therefore had no reason to guard against, I added a new one to the long list of hazards of speculation that I must always keep before me. It was simply that the fellows who had sold me the coffee, the shorts, knew what was in store for them in their efforts to squirm out of their position into which they had sold themselves devised a new way of welshing. They rushed to Washington for help and they got it. So the people who sold Livermore coffee went to Washington and said that Livermore is going to destroy the coffee markets. And so the government decided to bail out the coffee market. When I lose money by reason of some development which nobody could foresee, I think no more vindictive of it than I do of an inconveniently timed storm. Life itself from the cradle to the grave is a gamble and what happens to me because I do not possess the gift of second sight I can bear undisturbed so basically he's saying it happens with a silent sh and you just have to get over it and again from a philosophical standpoint a lot of what he says makes a lot of sense he didn't always follow his philosophies though I have in mind certain hazards of speculation that from time to time remind me a man that no profit should be counted safe until it is deposited into your bank account. Amen. One thing that I preach quite often is avoid mentally monetizing trades. Looking at how much you're up and thinking about what you could do with that money, especially when you have to let that stock potentially draw down a little bit down to your protective stop. So what I often tell people, and I do the same thing, or try to do the same thing at least, I try to mentally monetize down to the stop. So let's 
for instance, take a look at that LFMD. So the first loaf, I made 1% on that. If I scratch out, same thing with K&F, then I make 0%, but overall, I made a little money. Now, if it continues to run, then I'm going to continue to bump that stop higher. And wherever that stop is, that's how much money I'm going to make, barring overnight gaps, of course, when, not if, I'm stopped out. You never count your money while you're sitting at the table. Kenny Rogers. And that makes a lot of sense when it comes to trading. Little known fact, Kenny Rogers was a real pain in the arse to play cards with, as the Geico commercial explains. So Livermore does talk about tips and how you're under the influence of others. And that's kind of my takeaway. Somebody gives you a tip on something, they might be right, but they also have to give you a tip on when to sell. And very early in my career, I got some tips here or there, and, and you find out that sometimes people can actually be disingenuous. I probably trust too many people. Not anymore, though, but maybe back in the day. I will tell you my secret if you wish. It is this. I never buy at the bottom, and I always sell too soon. Well, he claims he never buys at the bottom, but in some cases, like the coffee trade that he sat in for a year, he did. But yes, that is one of the secrets of trend following. And as far as selling too soon, I think it's okay, and I think you should, scale out like I showed earlier with the core portfolio and then ride those stocks as long as they continue to move in your favor. In other words, as long as you're not stopped out. Now, he began to talk about investors. Investors are a different breed of cats. Most of them go in strong for inventories and statistics of earnings and all sorts of mathematical data as though they meant facts and certainties. They don't. The human factor is minimalized as a rule. One thing that I've been working on quite a bit on and off for the past year or so is apologetics for technical analysis, not religion, but technical analysis, in explaining why you should use technical analysis and performance-based metrics type of technical analysis, such as the zone charts for the TFM system to help you know when the market could be in trouble. And it is in a little bit of trouble right now. But that's the type of thing that I like to, to use with technical analysis. And the thing about technical analysis is people might think in fundamentals, but their actions are emotional. And then there's actually, we can kind of go off on a tangent on this, their actions are emotional because every decision you make is emotional. So no matter how you arrive to that decision, your actual decision to place the trade, when you actually place a trade, is an emotional decision. Now, that's not where I'm going with this. My point is that people buy and sell stocks for a variety of reasons, as Tom McClellan's mother, Marion, once pointed out. Some people buy when they have money, sell when they need money, and others use more sophisticated methods. And she wanted to say that everybody uses timing in their investments. Now, right now, we're in bow tie, proper order down for the S&P 500. And you can see we've been in a bit of a spill as of late. So why are people selling? Well, they might have some legitimate reasons. It might be fundamentals. But it could be past, present, and future reasons for selling some of the things that happens in the past. For instance, the market was doing well for a while, and now it's beginning to lose money. One of my friends visited a few weeks back, and his wife opened up the 401k on the way over, and that's when the market was blowing and going in the middle of summer, looking pretty good. And they were pretty upset about where they were, and he was pissed that she opened the letter on the way over <laughs> to ruin our nice dinner. But anyway, you kind of get the idea. So now that the market's getting slide a little bit, especially after opening up his 401k, he's beginning to rethink things. And I also did tell him, not that I want to be a, a told you so, believe me, not with my friends for sure, but I did explain to him when the market was beginning to crack a while back that it, he might want to think about getting out of the way. And he said, well, what's the worst can happen? I said, well, the market loses half its value and it takes 25 years to come back. And he's in his 50s like me, so I'm not sure he has that 25 years. So anyway, people can sell for a lot of reasons. You know, inflation, it's amazing how expensive everything is now. I used to never look at prices in the store. In fact, sometimes my wife would send me because she couldn't bear to look at the prices. It's just her psychological makeup. But lately, I have to admit, I'm looking at the prices 
and in some cases have bought a few generic brands here and there, something I never would do, and think twice on how hungry I am for a steak and whether or not I earned it by following my plan during the week and so on and so forth. So these are things that have never come into my head in my entire life up until now. Anyway, you might have some personal needs because there's less money to go around and you might not want to see your money evaporate yet again like my aforementioned friend. So people buy and sell for a variety of reasons and I think that's where he was going with that. Now he goes on to talk a little bit about intuition and as I preach almost every week, you've got to be super careful with intuition and as Ed Sakota says, sometimes people see it as into wishing. And if I could get into a state of flow, especially if I'm doing something a little bit more hyperactive, something I probably shouldn't be doing like intraday trading, but if I could wait and wait and wait to get into a state of flow, there, there are times where I'm completely in tune with the market. Other times I try to force that to happen. Now, if I could figure out when I'm in tune and be in tune and not try to force it, you might not see my fat buttocks <laughs> again. But anyway, I think that's where he's going with this. The training of a stock trader is like medical education. The physician has to spend long years learning anatomy, physiology, material medica, and collateral subjects by the dozen. He learns the theory and then proceeds to devote his life to the practice. He observes and classifies all sort of pathological phenomenon. He learns to diagnose. If his diagnosis is correct, and that depends upon the accuracy of his observation, he ought to do pretty well in his prognosis. Always keep in mind, of course, that human fallibility in the utterly foreseen will keep him from scoring 100% bullseye. So basically he's saying you need a ton of experience as a trader to get to the uh, level of proficiency. And then as he gains experience, he learns not only to do the right thing, but to do it instantly so that many people will think he does it instinctively. And that's one thing that's kind of a beautiful thing. It doesn't happen that often, but every now and then I have a bit of an out-of-body experience where I'm taking profits, where I should be taking profits, or I'm entering trades, or I'm trailing that stop, or in some cases just bailing out on something that's not working because it had, it had touched that stop. And sometimes I'll do these things automatically. And what's amazing is after it's all done, I'll be like, what the hell did I do? And then it works out, not all the time, but it'll work out swimmingly when these things happen. So that's kind of like an instinctive place you want to be. And it's, um, I'm going to butcher his name, but Mahaley, uh he talks a lot about flow. He's got a book written on flow. And I think that this is sort of where Livermore is going to the, here, is getting into that state of flow. And that's something that I've worked really hard to figure out. And I hadn't quite figured it out yet, but if there's a way to bottle it up, I think you could own the world if you figured out how you're in the state of flow and how to get into that state of flow. And I get into a state of flow a lot of times hobby-wise. I'll be something stupid as cutting wood or sanding or some of my other hobbies, whatever the case may be. I kind of lose track of time or sometimes time slows or speeds up or whatever the case may be. And it's like you just get into this really great mindset. And every now and then, and it helps to have a little experience, but every now and then you could get into the mindset with trading. Anyway, and then as he gains experience, he learns not only to do the right thing, but to do it instantly so that many people will think he does it instinctively. It really isn't automatism. There's a new word. It is that he has diagnosed the case according to his observations of such cases during a period of many years. And naturally, after he has diagnosed it, he can only treat it in the way that experience has taught him is the proper treatment. You could transmit knowledge, that is, your particular collective of card index facts, but not your experience. A man may know what to do and lose money if he doesn't do it quickly enough. So he's kind of hinting toward that intuition, that getting into that state of flow. And that's something that I'm going to revisit quite a bit. And hopefully we'll figure out how to get into that state of flow. But I, I like where he's going with that. I like the fact that if you just have a lot, a lot of experience, I think that's going to help tremendously. And the other thing is 
you just need to ask yourself, and again, I hate to beat the dead horse, but like Sakota says, you need to ask yourself, is it truly intuition or are you into wishing? Well, that's my time for this week. I want to thank everybody for watching. Again, follow-up information, daylearner.com slash stock charts. You can reach me, daylearner.com slash contact, or on X at T Following Moron, YouTube at Dave Landry. And join me each week on Thursdays for a live webinar. And keep an eye out for some YouTube lives. Please uh, subscribe and like my channel. Also, the video you're watching now is on Stock Charts channel. Make sure you subscribe and like here too. I want to thank everybody for watching and may the trend be with you.